Greetings, adventurers. Welcome to Homebrew. Pull yourself up a chair and have yourself a drink as we begin to build a whole new adventure. Today is the start of the DM tutorial on building an adventure, specifically in this case, the duet that we'll be performing with Sarah on Taking Root is the name of the campaign. This is going to be a precursor campaign, uh, an origin story for her character Emery, as you will, for the up and coming campaign that we'll be streaming with three players starting in June, probably about late June. So get ready to rock for that. If you are looking for DM tips in how to build a campaign and run a session and build sessions and change it on the fly, this is the perfect space for you. Now I must warn you, spoilers. We're going to just dig into everything. What the story is going to be, if it changes over time, uh, all of the background hints and everything. So if you're just looking to listen to the story, Emery's origin story, and uh, I'm going to try to keep all of the, the second campaign material out of this particular series. But for this particular campaign, if you're looking to just sit back and listen to it, we'll be posting those videos. Just keep skipping over these ones, all right? So we'll, be, we'll have it clearly delineated in the video, as you can see already. Anyways, from there, we've got a lot to get cracking on. So sit back and relax, and we'll get started. So campaign here, what are we doing? So today, we're going to cover how to build session one of our campaign. Now, unfortunately, we can't just start with that, right? It's the first step of a full adventure, which means that we need to have where we're going planned out. Otherwise, our first step is gonna be in the wrong direction. And so this particular video is gonna be a bit long because we're gonna to start to cover some of the basic campaign items that you need to cover in order to just have your first session. Now we already covered session zero where we got a lot of information and feedback from the player just to make sure that we don't set off in a direction that they're not looking forward to. And we got some feedback on them to make sure that our campaign was gonna be something that would be fun for them. Now again with this one, because this campaign is going to be tied in with another one, there's going to be some special considerations that we have to do as well, uh, just to make sure that everything is fitting perfectly. Um, in this particular setting, we are using a My World Named Dwelling. Uh, if you have your own world or if you have some place that you'd like to, you know, an IP that you'd like to set your world in, go ahead and just use that. However, one thing that I am kind of glazing over is the fact that I'm very familiar with this world as I am the one who designed the world. Uh, so that is one thing that we're not going to get too in depth in is, you know, how do you get that level of preparedness? Um, but it's just that kind of a cautionary item that I would say for this. And I don't think it's absolutely necessary either. All right. So first of all, when it comes to making campaigns, um, you know, I think that it's an important point to mention that the campaign is made as it's played, right? As a DM, your job is not to construct a full story start to beginning like writing a book, uh, there's some collaboration with your players. And so that is a, definitely a huge portion of what we want to be talking about here at the beginning, or at least it's not going to take a lot of time, but it is absolutely important that we cover it, right? So uh, what are a couple of things that we need to absolutely make sure that we know? Well, we do need to give the players some direction, uh, but the players need to have some free will. That is the difference between, uh, or that is the reference to railroading and player agency. Now, we do need to have some railroading that is inherent. Uh, some people use that word as a connotation for some of the things that the DM does. And I'll explain what I choose to do as a DM to make sure that we have a good balance, okay? Now, I run a sandbox world, and I use railroading uh, as a method to give the players direction, okay? So I come to my players at the beginning and I say that we, we tend to have a handshake agreement. And this, this is what the same thing with every DM out there. Um, it's just sometimes it's forgot, uh, forgotten to be said explicitly. Okay, so what am I getting at here? Uh, it is the DM's responsibility to offer a path and a story. Okay, you need to give them three things. You need to give them an objective. What do we gotta do? You need to give them a motive. Why should they be doing it? And you need to give them a place to start, so a direction, okay? Uh, that is the responsibility of the DMs, to give them those three things. The player's responsibility is to bite down, okay? And so what I mean by this is that if you start your session one, right, and you have this great plan, 
you're going to take some magical ring, you know, across the whole lands and it's going to get thrown in a fire, right? And uh, you say, okay, there's this magical ring. I plop it in front of you guys and I say, this ring is, uh, you know, if the bad guy gets it and uh, whatnot, then the whole world is going to die. And, you're play and the players turn around and go, nah, I really don't care about anyone else but me. I'm just going to make use of my time. And they turn around and walk away. You've done your part. It is the player's responsibility to make a story together. You've developed a path that they can take, but at the same time, if they just turn left and head out, the kind of response is, as a DM, is that, okay, I've designed a world to tell a story about certain characters, and you've decided to play a character who's not gonna be a part of that story. So all the other players can continue on the story, but the other person needs to pick a new character that would be motivated to continue that. Now you do need to have some reasons that, that help kind of guide them in. So that's why the session zero is very important is understanding a little bit about those characters, but um, they need to find a way to round in to the reasons that you've given them, right? So maybe you've got a character that's interested in gold and you have something that's planned out that says, oh, hey, guess what? Um, there is uh, a kid stuck in a burning building. And you guys are like, well, there's no money to be had in that. I'm not very nice. And it's like, well, it's his job to think of something along the lines of, oh, well, if I save this kid, then I can lean on the parents to give me money, you know, really hard on that. Like, hey, you know, maybe you do, he does it beforehand. He says, I'll go in there and I'll save that kid if you give me money. And they say, sure, I'll give you everything I want, right? That's the, the way that the player can turn and use his own agency to make the story work for him but he does need to engage with what you have okay so we need to have today an objective a motive and a direction all right and that's it so let's go ahead and go over some constraints okay so i can't have any objective and i can't have any motive i have some things that my par my characters have talked to me about my players have talked to me about their characters sorry about that and I have some real world constraints as well, okay? So we do plan on having a different campaign and we've already started to discuss where that campaign is going to be. So because of that, I know that the character Emery who is in this campaign, who needs to be in that other campaign, needs to be where that other campaign starts around the end of this one. Now we can do some time-lapse tricks and whatnot, but I should have them in that area by the end of that and that campaign will start to take place near the woodlands of this world. So if you see here on my map, the woodlands is this area down here. We need to consider that they'll need to be probably in this area if we want her to be starting where all the other characters are starting. Now, let's move on to our next item. Uh, this needs to be about six to 10 sessions long, specifically because I want to make sure that we time things correctly with the launch of the other campaign. All right. Next item, it needs to be level appropriate. So I need to make sure that the character that Sarah's playing is able to do the things in that area because I don't change my world to fit the characters. I make sure that the campaign runs through the world in a path that would fit the characters, right? And that's not something that you necessarily need to do, but it's something that I choose to do. And as a DM, it would be much easier so you don't have to change the stats of all of these creatures. You can keep the creatures canonical don't mess with their stats. You can tweak them a little bit, but keep them, you know, 90% of what they were. And then you don't have to worry about that too much. Okay, so uh, Sarah's character is starting at base level, level one, if you're going to be talking D&D terms or with no extra XP right out the gates if we're talking about Genesis. Okay, so um, their character should get about six level ups or uh, that's about 150 XP by the end of this. Uh, so that's something that I just need to consider as we're moving forward with, say, loot and whatnot, okay? Uh, I need to make sure that their origin is world appropriate. So they gave me their character and they told me what kind of race that they were going to be. And I need to make sure that that person would realistically live there, right? Doing the things that they realistically would. Uh, and so for this particular situation, we chose that her character is a Wulund. A Wulund is very similar to, like, uh, a wood elf and a satyr. It's all of your woodland beings, your sapient creatures who belong in that kind of woodland mythos, okay? So typically they've got um, uh, some sort of small antler or horn. Uh, they can talk, they can speak common languages, and they have had some sort of, uh, some sort of kindred spirit with the woodlands. So we're going to start in the Gnarlwood, which is up here. 
The reason why I chose the Gnarl Wood instead of just having Sarah's character, Emery, start in the Woodlands and end in the Woodlands is because I didn't want her character to have extra bonus knowledge about the area that they're starting in in the secondary campaign. I also don't have to worry about running into plot holes between this campaign and the other campaigns because her character will be new to an area and the campaign will be fresh in that sense as well. So just some considerations that I've done when designing this campaign. And I'm giving you guys a summary of this, but this realistically took me, you know, multiple car rides of thinking and some notes in the middle of the night when I wake up sort of thing. So it's just something that I don't actively work on. I just kind of... Um, I pick at it uh, with, you know, my coffee in the morning, that sort of thing. And as it comes to me, I'll wrote, write down notes. And then every now and then I'll come down and I'll actually start typing some stuff up. So you guys didn't miss anything by me writing this out here for you. It's just to keep me on track here. All right. Uh, allows the character to establish the skill. So one thing that we talked about when it came to this campaign was that uh, Emery is going to develop her magic in this origin story that's the purpose of this origin story we want to showcase them developing their magic and so that was one thing that i needed to build in into the campaign is how are they going to do this okay uh next thing here uh it doesn't conflict with the other campaigns we've already talked about that um so yeah those are some of the constraints that we have uh one of the items that we were talking about as well with her magic is that she's going to have a construct right in this world we'll call it memory uh like a like a mimic but memory it's uh basically a, a woodland uh mechanic construct or a woodland golem okay and she wants to make sure that she can use the spirit of her brother to animate it and come have it come to life and be able to interact with her brother okay so um if that's how she's going to start the next campaign we want to flush that out in this one and include how her brother died right if we're going to do an origin story we have to have her brother dying as a part of it right all right so character object character objective uh bring back their dead brother that's their whole objective okay that's gonna be our uh our number one here and why is pretty easy with that so we can build into that because they you know they they love their brother right it's something that's super quick and easy to attach to that okay um and a direction of where to start how do you bring someone back from the dead? That's gonna be much harder, all right? And so what we're gonna do is, with our objectives, we're actually gonna put it somewhere. And we're gonna say, we're gonna have, we're gonna make you travel across the world, or in this case, across the old world, uh, also known as Utica for this area. We're gonna make you go from the Gnarlwood all the way down to this area, kind of by what's called Carnation. And we're gonna make you do that so that way you, you can resurrect your brother or uh, some semblance of your brother in that area or get access to his spirit, okay? So the reason why I'm doing that is that, that my objective is that I want to get her down there for the next campaign. But we're also doing it because canonically, that's where a lot of the magic that can do those sorts of things comes from. And so now we've got uh, some really good useful tools in our belt to be able to keep moving things along and adding some of these extra layers. All right. So why does she... Uh, Emery specifically have to bring back her dead brother. Why couldn't her dad or someone who knew how to do it, right? Um, they're a level one character. Well, I'm just going to kill off everyone else. I'm just going to kill them all off. The reason why is because then it's up to her and her alone, right? And kill them off doesn't necessarily mean I have to kill them. I can do other things too. We'll see that actually I enslave them. Um, but uh, that's, uh, we're, we're getting to that. So why isn't she dead if she why isn't she dead if everyone else is dead right so we have to come up with a reason of how emory escaped whereas no one else did all right uh why now right is this years later um you know if if her brother died 10 years ago why is she now going after to try to resurrect her brother and that's something that sometimes you can trip on if you're just making up your story um, kind of as you go or if you didn't think this stuff through at the beginning. So we're going to have it happen. We're going to have her set up right after her brother dies because that makes the most sense. And sometimes the reason why they don't go and try to s resurrect their brother now could be that they didn't know they could, right? That's not a 
common knowledge item. This world is very broken and disconnected from itself. Um, magic, there's a lot of magic, but communication is where there's there's not like a local newspaper or anything like that. There's The world is steeped in suspicion and myth, and um, that's kind of where you see a lot of uh, magic um, coming from in, in multiple forms, which is uh, kind of a beauty of dwelling. All right. So the brother just died. Easy solution, right? Your br the brother's immediately dead. Uh, a solution presented itself immediately. Oh, hey, uh, I know how exactly how to, how to pick him up, uh, how to resurrect him, and uh, we're going to go off and we're going to start doing that, okay? Um, reason why we need to make give them the solution right now is, like I was saying, is if they didn't have the solution, the campaign wouldn't start now. And realistically, we would be starting the campaign 10 years from now when they get the information. All right. So obstacles obviously there's some holes in this plan right they don't know how to resurrect their brother so we gotta tell them how to resurrect their brother that's a pretty simple and easy solution right there right uh, a couple ideas that come to mind someone tell them uh they find something that tells them right they hear a, a myth or something like that of how to do this right so there's a lot of different options uh i went with a stranger's gonna tell you how to do it now we gotta ask ourselves well why would a stranger tell you how maybe he owes you a favor right and that's how you can start seeing where we're getting into that session one uh why does this guy owe you a favor maybe you did something right off the gates to help him out and we can build that into what you were doing when your family and everyone else got the shaft so to speak right so um now we have some questions about okay well what was that guy up to uh why can why does he know how to do this why is he helping you right well, now we can start getting into that session one, right? So, um, why bother traveling? That's another question, right? If the wanderer can tell you how to resurrect your brother, you don't need to go across the world. Well, now we're going to say, well, the wanderer knows that that area, uh, in this particular case, Carnation, has the magic. He knows a guy over there. And because we did something for him, he's going to help us get there and uh, get in contact with that person, right? Um, your Emery wants to talk to her brother. Uh, dream walking is uh, kind of the way that they have to do that. And so we'll talk about that here in just a second too. So uh, we got a campaign summary already starting for us, right? Um, we're gonna travel across the world, uh, across the old world. So let's uh, get from here to there. Uh, we need to learn how to uh, channel the energy of our brother into a body, okay? Um, we need to learn how to use witchcraft and do memory on the way because that's part of the fun, right? It's not like we kind of run into a hole if the character like gets all the way to the other side and then suddenly get, learns all of the magic all at once. We just had a whole campaign where they had no abilities then, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, the wanderer or the guy that the Emery meets at the beginning he knows some magic in this in this realm. He can make woodland constructs or memory, or timber memory, and um, but he doesn't know how to bring her brother specifically into this, right? And so that is where we get into some of these other characters that they can bring in who know a different kind of magic and work it in that way. Okay, so now we have um, this this wanderer character is going to teach. Emery how to do her magic as they travel back to his homeland. I think it's just a lot of things that can happen. It's a big country. There's a lot that can happen between the Gnarl Wood and Lamore incarnation, okay? Um, so that's where our campaign and our little side adventures and all of that can really start to take place. Okay, moving off of that. Uh, we got to name everybody. That's one of those things. So you'll see that I start plugging in names for some of these characters. Um, so we have this this guy who we'll call him G. Uh, he knows how to use a different kind of magic to create a phylactery for your brother. Um, basically what that means is that now you can make something that's basically an enchantment with his soul on it and then slip that onto your slip that onto your magical construct and now your brother is living in the construct right so teach you how to make the constructs along the way once you get there 
And now you can put your brother in it. And so what we can do is, in the meantime, we can use a different type of magic called dreamwalking, uh, which is another form of spirit magic that this would this wanderer would be able to do to help her talk to her brother and keep him on spiritual life support, so to speak, between here and there. So now we got some ideas kind of moving around here that will turn into a pretty good story, I think. Now we can have some other side stories that are coming up too, right? What's up with this wanderer? What's up with your companion? Uh, we have to get rid of your family somehow, right? So uh, what we can do is canonically, uh, there are some, some characters called Onyx, which are golem rock guys who are looking to do some shenanigans in the area. And um, there are some, also some people called Profane, uh, Vampire, which is your classic vampire, work for them pretty much. And what we can have is that they basically try to grab them all up and put them into slaver. The reason why this works really well is because Holden Ford is known for necromancy. And this whole mountain range is controlled partially by these Onyx characters. Uh, and so we can have kind of this area, the Gnarlwood, where, her, where Emery's family is from, uh, be a perfect area for kidnapping and what can happen is is that because Lemoore is a city steeped in biological experimentation we can have the, the onyx be from there originally trying to work on people and do these kind of weird experiments and stuff like that but because they didn't want to draw attention to themselves maybe they grabbed people from further away right and then kind of moved them down here some of the magic and whatnot that they would do and why they needed a vampire that's a bit semantic so you can kind of make up your own stuff that stuff just happens to be canonical for me and kind of my intentions with those side stories and what this onyx and stuff like that might be intending to do so now we've got we've got a main story to save the brother but we also have a side story and that side story is get vengeance right or save more people because they're enslaved right um so why is your brother dead instead of enslaved well, so here's the thing. The people who are enslaved are basically dead because they're going to be stripped of their soul and it's going to get stuck in a gem, okay? And so that's not good. And so what we're going to have is the, the wanderer, um, he knows how to practice uh, necromancy. But in this world, necromancy is more like the magic of recycling and reusing stuff. So he's going to kill the brother and say, hey, I can make your brother a new body back in Carnation. And we can save him that way but he's screwed if he goes with the slaves and so now we're going to have this kind of this weird emotional tension and this conflict in there um, we're going to have a whole bunch of baddies at the starting point so they're going to have to leave together or risk death um, and so now we've got this great option for kind of building up this like complex relationship between the wanderer who we got to name everyone right so let's call him archek so em emery and archek will have this Kind of mixed relationship and then the brother of emory who's now dead his name is oliver because i asked my character my player what they would like them to be named and they started to give me a bio on kind of how to role play them too so they just don't know that they're dead immediately all right they knew that they'd be dead by the end of the first campaign so now we've got more information to be able to pull into this and make this a dynamic experience for sarah all right what do we got next so let's talk loot um we can actually start with giving the player money. And the reason why I'm gonna do this is uh, we said before we gotta have our character meet this person, this wanderer, Archek, and we have to have them be away from the tribe when the, um, when the slavering thing happens, right? So what we're gonna have them do is they're gonna march over to Bronton and trade with them, right? We're a bunch of woodland folk. We got things that Bronton doesn't have access to. Bronton doesn't have, has, sorry, has certain things that we don't have access to. Our character's gonna be over there, try to get some trade going on, have money for the tribe in their pocket, right? So now, the reason why we want them to start with lots of money is that because they're a single player, they need access to resources so that way they can think their way through problems and go around problems rather than trying to club them to death because that doesn't work very well when you're alone in level one. Right, so a little bit more of those considerations for the duet. Second thing is this gives them isolated in a place where they can help out this Archek guy. So we've kind of solved multiple things here, okay? And now we can make up a story why 
Archic is here and why he wants to go back to Lamar, right? So what we're going to have is there's a secret objective. He has a secret objective in Bronton. He gets foiled. Now, he's going to be uh, someone who isn't liked in that area. We have to establish some sort of conflict, so we'll call him a Tekechnu. He's a bug guy. The bug guys are typically from the Carnation area. And we'll say that he was trying to do something up here. He failed. The villagers saw him, got superstitious about what he was up to. And our character needed to save them from them because they were going to go all mob style on him. Our character's a woodland person, much more acceptable of unique races, and kind of escorts them back to the Gnarl Wood. Now, at this point, there's bad stuff happening there. The, the, the Archek decides to save the brother. Says, hey, I can, I can save him, but you have to trust me. Kills him. The bad guys notice this. They try to escape. And now we've got our, that's our first like session. That's a lot of material right there alone that we can work with with making our session one. They start heading down towards Carnation. We'll deal with the rest of that later. We got our campaign figured out, and we've got most of the material for our session one. Let's take a look. What do we got left here? Uh, loot. So if we're not going to be using money, what else do we want? Well, our character, our player, already told us what they wanted. And so they've got five spells, uh, which is typical on what you, how you create a character right off the gates in our homebrew system. I'm going to withhold them from them because I know that that's okay, but I've already consulted with them about it. And I'm going to give it to them as they learn their magic because this is an origin story on how they came from a nobody to a somebody. So we built out their spells. These are all things that that Archek would know how to do, and he's going to teach her how to do those and reward the person that way. All right? Fun. Let's get into session one. So you meet the Wanderer, make him owe you, you kill the brother, save Emery, force action. Nice and easy, right? All right. What would your character slash society be doing, right? So this is what kind of what we were talking about before. Um, well, we got to build distance from the brother, so let's say trading, right? The Wanderer has to be there for, uh, for a reason, like we were talking about before. Uh, we have to force disengagement, like we were talking about. We have to discover the, the, the brother and what's going on with him. And we have to force fleeing, but not combat. The reason why is because we're a duet, we're alone. These are really high power, power characters because we want to heavily emphasize that you need to get out of there instead of fight and then grieve there on the spot. There are certain situations where that would be acceptable as a campaign, but in our particular case, we're not really looking for that, all right? So now, we kind of already got our day one here, right? Uh, you start in Bronton, and you're trading with the locals. Uh, a bit of piece of uh, <laughs> lore for the world here. You're breeding wolves into tame creatures for them, because Bronton's known for being the first place with domesticated dogs. So where did they get them? The Wulund, they're really good at uh, animal stuff, right? So that makes perfect sense. You're trading with them. You need the sale to go well because there's some other stuff going on. I'm going to keep this a secret for myself, but basically the, 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 the wolves have been playing nice really lately, okay? You make up some money. Figures passing through. Don't know who he is, but one of the puppies that you sold is hurt and whimpering and crying. And this guy, this wanderer, walks up to the puppy and heals it but the kids get scared of the cre of the the creature because he's a bug person in a, hidden in a cloak and so then they start poking pointing fingers at him especially because one of them is a god in hiding and he then they want to thwart this techno because this this guy named archek who is this cloaked figure he's trying to do something here and other forces are stopping him so there's going to be some subplot that we can build and you don't even have to figure that out right now but you want to build in some of these little things so that way later on uh, you can start revealing them to your players and they're like, oh, that was that all along. It's like, yeah, sure, it was that all along, but to them it doesn't make any difference, right? So you can weave in some of this stuff here. Um, they get afraid that there's this other god involved lady named Lady Morrow. They're known for kidnapping children. This is a pretty dark world, all right? Uh, so they think this bug person is this Lady Morrow. They're going to try to kill this guy. He's running out of town. You try to save him. You try to get him back to your tribe. Now he owes you. He owes you big, okay? He's thwarted. He needs to go home anyways to rethink his primes and talk to his buddies too. So now you've got a reason why he's going that way. Between that, And you've got a secret reason why he's going that way, all right? You also got money in the pocket of your player. 
All right, now we've got some time lapse just because of how big the world is. We got to remember to keep this keep this uh, canonical here a little bit. You don't need to do too much with it though. If you don't want to, you can make it a whole thing if you want to too. Depends on how many sessions you have, right? Uh, we go across the Fulcrum Stream as you get closer to your village called Nintanga. We had to just start naming things, right? This village is just going to be their tribes named the Nintanga tribe because, well, I wanted it and it sounded right. All right, moving on. Uh, you notice something's wrong. You got to tip them off about, you know, something creepy going on with the village. That way they start getting cautious as they go there. You can have progressive checks. You can have just narrative, whatever you want. Uh, depends on how much your characters want to roll and depends on how much failure you want to introduce to the system. I cannot have Sarah fight the Onyx and the vampire. She will die instantly. So I need to give a lot of it, um, notification in advance. And that's why this is in my notes. All right, you arrive early in the morning. The reason why I'm gonna have her arrive early in the morning is because I don't want the vampire to be out. Otherwise, it's, and the Onyx are rock people. I can say that she can run away from those. But the vampire, if it's nighttime, she's just screwed. So I'm just gonna have it be during the day when she gets there, okay? It's not, I'm the DM, that's my choice. Now, hopefully, hopefully, Sarah doesn't do some weird things with her player freedom to have that not be the case but that's where you as the dm can start introducing other facts to kind of kind of tailor it your way right and uh just as long as you don't directly hard block them from their agency okay uh, i'm gonna name drop some of the guys involved at this point so that way later on if she hears those names she can get clued in on those side objectives that we're talking about. I picked a name for the vampire, Ephemria, and I picked a name for the Onyx Lieutenant. His name's gonna be Rot. All right, now I got a couple of lines to remember for when they're gonna be um, going through this, just so that way I have some vocal prompts for when Sarah's actually in the moment, you know, trying to deal with the situation. I remember um, that there's this, you know, like, <laughs> let's just say our check, I can save one of them, but we must run when I do. I know she's going to try to save her brother, right? Because I know that that's the one relationship that my player mentioned. Um, I also mentioned here that you got to go. He's tipping her off that this is going to make a lot of noise. Things are going to get bad quickly, right? And I've kind of already thought of how this character can get out of here, right? So now if the player comes up with an alternative way of getting out of here, I can choose that. I don't need to choose mine. I just had to come up if I just need to make sure that there was not no way out, right? You got to think that stuff through just in case you didn't, <laughs> you built, you painted yourself into a corner. All right. And, uh, that's going to be session one. All right. So, uh, one thing to, you know, day 11, the reason why I have this in here, uh, our chick explains all of her situation, right? He's got to, he's got to explain why the brother's dead and why that's somehow saving him. Right. So you have to have that information in your brain and now i've got you know where you're gonna end up if you hop into that river it's gonna take you down you know let's take a look at that map here quick right so this here is called the fulcrum stream it continues down here and it goes up from all the way up into these woods so it's gonna take them out towards holden ford a city known to be wrought with dark magic so maybe ephemera will come up maybe we'll save that for later we don't know right that's for tomorrow so that's all I got for you guys today uh, on the campaign building there and on the notes taking side. The only other things that I do for taking, getting ready for my session is that I built a couple of things here in World 20 and you can do this in person as well. I've got all my minis and my table over there, but we're using World 20 for this just for you guys' viewing pleasure. It's a little bit crisper. Uh, a couple of things that I did is I made it, I got a token for my uh, player. I got a couple tokens for some of the, the, the peasants and stuff like that. I could be involved with maybe a skirmish um, and I got a couple maps built up and ready to go as well I got a couple background imagery uh, items just to give my players some cues as the tone of the world right um, and then on these on these maps here I've kind of just started to put down a couple of the tokens on what some of the characters would look like and that's all I really need for those then I built up here a quick uh, this is my creature catalog. This is all of the things that could have stats in it. And what I did is I just went ahead and I pulled stats for peasants that could be fighting, um, you know, when you're trying to save Archek. I got Archek stats. I've got some summons that Archek can use. And I specifically did not grab stats for the vampire or for the golems because 
I do not want her fighting those. I will make ability checks and stuff like that, but there's no way in hell all these guys are gonna kill them anyways, so there's no point in having stats for them. So you get some preparatory items here, just in case you need to start rolling some stuff. You can make up a lot of it on your fly. One thing I did need to make sure of is that if she starts to skirmish a couple of the peasants in the woods, because my maybe I thought that was, things were getting dull and needed some combat to spruce things up and build tension, I didn't make them too hard. So things that I thought of here is that these characters, these peasant minions, are weak enough that our player actually has the stats, even though they're going to be a, a, a tinkerer for the most part, they have the stats to potentially kill these guys in one shot with their weapon, right? So their weapon can do three plus two, so five damage. You can whack a peasant and they're down. So that's kind of the benefit of that. And then one thing is I didn't have a, a peasant adversary. I had like knights and stuff like that. And so I just kind of built something off of goblins and kind of tweaked it a little bit just to make sure that, you know, because these guys are going to come after them in tunics and pitchforks. They're not going to be a goblin with a crude sword and, you know, leather armor or something like that. So I made it something that, she, something that she could easily survive. I got a couple extra references, a cheat sheet, all that sort of stuff that you can see posted with the video. Uh, nice and ready to go for when we play, but it, we're not playing today. So that's stuff that I'll set up before our first session. And that's about all you really need. Well, thank you for joining us for our campaign prep and for our session one prep for the Taking Roots uh, campaign that we are about to set off. I look forward to seeing you guys on our maiden voyage, and Sarah does too. Thank you.